and welcome to week eight of our study of the book of John called Bear Witness to the Light. We've spent the last seven weeks looking at the stories of ordinary people who encountered Jesus during his earthly ministry and their lives became radically transformed. From the disciples to Nicodemus, the woman at the well to Mary and Lazarus, we've experienced together so many beautiful stories of people who knew our Savior firsthand in person. And today's is one of my very favorites. It's the story of Mary Magdalene. Now, when I say the name Mary Magdalene, a lot of images might pop into your mind. Maybe you've heard she was a prostitute. Maybe you've heard she was an apostle, that she wrote her own gospel, or maybe that she was Jesus's wife, if you read a certain popular novel a few years back. I did a Google search, very not comprehensively, and found 145 paintings that feature Mary Magdalene, everyone from Rembrandt to Titian, Caravaggio to Michelangelo. There is something so compelling about her, about her story, and about how her story has been shaped by time, legend, and imagination. But the picture that scripture, and particularly that John, paints is one of Jesus's beloved friend, a woman with a transformed life, a woman that Jesus trusted with the good news on the morning of his resurrection. And that's the Mary Magdalene that we're gonna spend time with today. First, we'll take a look at what the Bible actually says about her. Then we'll dive into today's passage and unpack her role in Jesus's death, burial, and resurrection. And finally, we'll ask what it means for us to have such an intimate friendship with Jesus. So first, who is Mary Magdalene? In every gospel account except for Luke, Mary first appears at the crucifixion. Luke writes in chapter eight of the women who traveled with Jesus. Verses one through three say, soon afterward, he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the 12 were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chaza, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others, who provided for them out of their means. We learn three things about Mary here. One, she was from Magdala, which was a town near the Sea of Galilee. Two, Jesus had healed her from seven demons. And three, she, along with other women, traveled with Jesus and provided for him and the disciples. And then the next we hear about her is at the crucifixion of Jesus. So what did we not learn here? She wasn't a prostitute. She was unlikely to have been the woman who anointed Jesus with alabaster. And she wasn't married to Jesus. The International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, which is a lot of big words all smushed together as the title of a book, says, as she was the first to bear witness to the resurrection of Jesus, it is important that we should get a correct view of her position and character. The idea that she was a penitent drawn from the life of the street undoubtedly arose in the first instance from a misconception of the nature of her malady together with an altogether impossible identification of her with the woman who was a sinner of the preceding section of the gospel. The article goes on to explain that having seven demons meant that she would have been diseased and is healed as an invalid. So regarding the misidentification of Mary as the woman in Luke 7, the woman in the preceding section of the gospel who anointed Jesus' feet, There are no contextual links or clues that they would be the same. The woman in in Luke 7 is unnamed by Luke, who would have known and traveled with Mary Magdalene. She has described the woman as a forgiven sinner, where Mary Magdalene was described as one who had been healed. Sinner versus the healing of of a malady, of an infirmity, a disease. Mary, of course, would have been a forgiven sinner, but we all fit that description. Rebecca McLaughlin, an author that I love and highly recommend, says this, 
We don't know this Mary's marital status or whether she had children. We don't know what she looked like or anything about her sexual history. The idea that she was a reformed prostitute was introduced centuries after her death. All Luke tells us is that Jesus cast seven demons out of her. Mary Magdalene had been utterly ravaged by the spiritual forces of evil. The last person we might expect to be recruited to the Son of God's core team. But Jesus likes to pick the most unlikely people. And this Mary not only travels with Jesus during his ministry, she also plays a critical role in testifying to Jesus' resurrection. So let's move on now to that role that Mary played during Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. We know she is a follower of Jesus who follows Jesus, who cares for him and the disciples, and that she had been radically healed by Jesus. And then we get to the crucifixion, and we see the portrait of a faithful friend. Matthew, Mark, and John all describe her on the day of Christ's crucifixion. Matthew says in chapter 27, verses 55 and 56, right after Jesus has died, there were also many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Fun fact about that phrase, ministering to him. These are women, and the verb to minister is used to describe their actions. The Greek word here is diakono, which means to serve, and is the root word of the word deacon or deaconess. These women were serving Jesus, And the word that Matthew uses here is the same word used in 1 Timothy 3 to describe the function of a deacon in the early church. It's just a fun fact. Then Matthew says, after Jesus is buried, in verse 61, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. So picture it in your mind for a second. Two women keeping watch, sitting vigil, alone by the tomb, undoubtedly weeping. Have you ever stood at the grave of someone you love? It's not an opportunity that we get with most people, with most acquaintances. Sure, we'll go to the funeral. We'll pay our respects by sending a card or making a donation or bringing a meal. But think about the people whose graves you've stood at and the so sacred ground that that is. When Jesus was buried, it wasn't his disciples. They were hiding for the very legitimate fear that they were going to be arrested. But it was Mary, the mother of John, and Mary, the friend of Jesus, consumed with grief, holding the tension between the things that we say we believe and the act of putting someone we love in the ground. Will those things be true? Mary must have wondered. And so that's Matthew. Mark says, describing Jesus' death in chapter 15, verses 40 and 41, there were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph and of Siloam. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. But there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Now, John's account of Mary at the crucifixion in chapter 19, verses 25, says this. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. So these are the facts that we have about Mary Magdalene at the crucifixion. And I keep coming back to this facts thing because it's actually really important. When real people who lived real lives in the Bible become caricatures, when their place in our cultural zeitgeist is built on rumor or story rather than scripture, we can quickly run afoul of orthodoxy and subscribe convictions or ideas about how we should or should not behave based on a supposition about someone in the Bible. So that's really important for us to know and to remember as we move into the next movement of Mary's story. Mary is the one 
whom Jesus chooses to reveal himself to first in his resurrected glory. Let's look at how John describes this encounter, but know that all four gospel writers record it. It's another one of those nuggets in scripture that no doubt would have been scrubbed from history if it weren't true. Jesus appearing to a woman after his resurrection. So many unbelievable things in that one phrase. But we get not one or two, but all four gospel writers recording it. Here's what John says, and then we'll look at a few of the details we receive from the other gospels. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus's head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as they yet did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside of the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned to him and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Then Jesus said to her, do not cling to me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. There are a couple of places I want us to camp out for just a second here. First, why Mary came to the tomb, which is an account that we get from Luke and Mark. Second, how she reacted to the resurrected person of Jesus and to his body. And third, what happened next when she went to bear witness to the disciples? In Luke's account, he writes in chapter 24, verse one, on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. Mark says in 16:1, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so they might go and anoint him. When they arrived, they found the tomb was open and empty. In each gospel account, an angel or two appear and tell Mary that the prophecy has been fulfilled and Jesus has risen from the dead. We cannot fathom what she must have felt in that moment. Some of the words that the gospels use to describe her in these moments are frightened, alarmed, trembling, astonishment, afraid, fear, great joy, weeping. Mary has a physical reaction to the physical body of Jesus. In two accounts, in John and Matthew, we get clues about it. There are these little breadcrumbs showing us the tangibility of his resurrection. Later in John, we get the story of Thomas sticking his fingers in Christ's side. But when Jesus reveals himself to Mary, in John, he tells her, do not cling to me. Matthew says the women took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Think for a moment about the sensory experience Mary is having. Imaginative contemplation is an exercise where you read or you listen to a passage of scripture and vividly imagine the scene as if you were watching a movie. 
It is a beautiful way to engage in the gospels and the life of Jesus particularly. So I would love for you to close your eyes for just a minute and imagine in this moment what Mary is seeing, what she's feeling, tasting, smelling, speaking, and hearing. She is with her risen Lord, whom three days earlier she watched die. And this is profound. So I'm going to read you some of these phrases, these sensory phrases that we get in the Gospels. Early in the morning when it was still dark. Then at early dawn when the sun had risen. How would the sun have felt? How would the garden look? They brought spices. They had prepared spices. This was likely myrrh and aloes. How would the spices smell? Matthew says there was an earthquake and an angel of the Lord appeared. The angel or angels are like a lightning with clothes as white as snow, a white robe, dazzling in apparel, angels in white. The angel spoke. What would they have sounded like? What would they have looked like? How would the garden sound on that early morning? Mary felt his body clinging to it. She touched his feet. Were they warm? Were they soft from the anointing Nicodemus and Joseph had done a few days earlier? Were they clean? Were they still covered in dried blood from the cross? Mary had a physical experience with the risen Jesus. Her belief in him transcends a belief that we are afforded. Her level of belief is knowledge. She knew, she knew with her senses that this was Jesus. He called her by name and she felt him. And like so many others before her, what was her first action about con- after confronting the life-changing reality of Christ? To bear witness to him. In John's gospel, Peter and John have already seen the empty tomb, but Jesus first appears to Mary. He tells her, go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And then Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. Mary Magdalene is commissioned to go. The first person to see and tell about the risen Christ. The other gospel writers recount this as well. Mark writes that the angel told her, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Matthew says, then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. Then you will see him. A few verses later, Jesus expands his commission to the disciples, saying in verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But this is the first recorded thing that Jesus does after his resurrection, to appear to Mary and tell her to bear witness. Let's think back to what we've learned about her today. She was ill with the seven demons and healed by Jesus. She traveled with him and the disciples to provide for him. She ministered to Jesus and the disciples. She watched him die. She prepared spices to anoint his dead body, only to be confronted physically with the reality of his risen frame. Then she ran to tell the disciples, her friends and companions in ministry and in grief, that it was true. Jesus was alive. And we don't know what happened to Mary next. There are no more references to her in scripture. But we do know that her message to the disciples made them aware of what they would see and feel when they saw Jesus in the next hours and days. And that those men would then be charged by Jesus to spread the gospel around the world. And that same message has traveled through time and generations and is still a living and active life-changing truth for you and for me today. So what is Mary's legacy? Pop culture has given us many versions, but I would hope that the legacy that we carry from Mary Magdalene is this. A healed woman who ministered to Jesus, 
who watched him die and who saw him alive again and could not keep it to herself. We don't have the privilege, you and I don't, of carrying those middle phrases. We are healed and we cannot keep it to ourselves. But those things in the middle, we did not travel with Jesus or minister to him. We did not watch him die. And we did not see him and touch him alive again. But because those things are true, we can bear witness to the hope that we have because of Jesus. But sometimes it's those middle things that are hard to believe. So how do we do it? How do we remember? We know we are healed. We know we can bear witness. How do we believe and know that Jesus came, died, and was risen again? There is one, a helper, an advocate, who Jesus commissioned to do that very thing. Romans 8, 15 through 17 says, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. As the Holy Spirit bears witness to us that we are children of God, may we then bear witness to the watching world that it is true that Christ has died, Christ is risen.